All right. So the power of advantage. We're going to, did everyone um, do their, their quiz, their advantage quiz for me, their homework? Because we're going to start there. Um, so I can't see you again. So just give me thumbs up. Um, when I ask questions, because this is going to be a little more interactive. So advantage scores, let's start it right there. First question in the chat, what do you think my advantage score is? What, what do you think mine is? Remember your, your advantage scores um, could have been as uh, high as two, 22. Um, and the lowest score is, is a negative 13. And so uh, what do you think my advantage score is? Let's see who can get closest to what my score is. I got a six so far, about a two, four, two, okay. Couple more, two. A, okay. John, why do you think it's an A? And um, after John, Holly, tell me, why do you think it's a two? John, can you hear me? All right, I don't know where John is. Uh, Gavin, why do you think it's a four? Okay. I seem to have a well-educated background. And, and Holly, why do you think it's a two? Oops, I lost my chat. Sorry, and I just gave you the answer. <laughs> I am a negative two. My advantage score with, although I'm highly uh, educationally advantaged, my overall advantage score was a negative two. What do you think really could be the reason why my advantage score is a negative two? With the education that I have, in the background that I have, how did I still end up with a negative two advantage score? Can anyone speak to that? Think about that? Oh, there's my chat again. By being conservative, um, okay. And race, gender, and family. Um, yes, um, did all the answers type. All right, so I don't know if it was so much about me being conservative um, for this advantage score as much as it was my human capital, yes. Um, really, it was family. My advantage score is really low because it was fa family. What I didn't say in, in the um, broader uh, group is, is that although my family uh, was all about education, um, I didn't talk about actually what happened in my home. See, this is why lived experiences are so important, right? And so my extended family uh, was amazing, but what happened in my home um, was very, very different than what uh, my extended family members were experiencing in their homes. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to have um, relatives and aunts and uncles that I was able to uh, learn from and be around and they kept me a lot. But the things that was happening in my home um, growing up, actually you wouldn't even think that I would be here today. Uh, based on my lived experience and what I was going through. Um, my family culture within my home was not favorable. And because of that, and because it wasn't favorable and my with my parents, it was not favorable. My advantage score uh, is a negative two. I, I shouldn't be here today. 
based on my lived experiences. So I want you to think about that. This really is the biggest difference between equality and equity. And I want you to think about your own advantage score. And think about why your advantage score is what it is. Yes, this is how I explain my past too. I was very fortunate, but some things that I've seen has molded me into who I am today. So, so when I say really think about like why you are the way you are, like economically, my extended family was very wealthy, but in my home, we were poor. I didn't know we were poor because other people took care of us. And I still had everything I, I wanted needed. But my birth mother, she didn't fall in the mold with her family. I also was raised by my grandparents. I left my birth mother's home when I was in the seventh grade. And I went to live with my grandparents. And so I was really raised in my formative years by my grandmother and my grandfather. Think about your family position. Are you the middle child, the baby child, or the oldest child? That all fits into your advantage score. Think about uh, where your parents educated. I read something uh, that I, I found very startling that, that said that most people with PhDs have at least one parent with a PhD. I found that starking. Like, wow, once again, I don't fit that at all. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I was just reading a message from Ms. Taylor. Um, so your advantage score really shows us what your lived experience is. So if you feel comfortable, in the chat, because I want to show how just different we all are, even though some of us all may look the same and may think we have the same background. Some of you may work together. Some of you um, may teach together. If you feel comfortable, um, put your advantage score into the chat so that people can see just how different we really are. So the highest I've seen is 19. The lowest is negative two. I'm seeing a lot of sixes and sevens, some tens. 19 seems to be the highest and you can get up to 22. The lower your score, the lower advantages you have, right? The higher your score the more advantages you have. The more advantages, the more advantage you are. So if you are now thinking about your work environment, right? And you're working with people that have an eight, a six, a negative two, and you have a 19. <laughs> What does that do to the dynamics of that work environment? Anyone, what does that do to the dynamics of the work environment? How do you 
bring equity into that picture. I'm going to unmute and I can give my answer. I just didn't have time to type it all. Oh, no, that's fine. Yes, you can unmute and talk as well. I, I, I thought this was supposed to be interactive. Yes. So I'm, I was looking forward to the interactive. So Absolutely. please just talk, chime in. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, we actually, I hosted a, an external speaker for my global team yesterday, and we had a deep conversation about equity and um, equality and the differences between, which is exactly what you've been talking about, what Eric talked about earlier. Um, the cool thing about it is for us, um, April is feedback month because we have navigated into an environment where we're giving peer to peer feedback and we as peers are not trained to give feedback. Um, so the one conversation I've been having with my team is that with all of these different scores, we have to take the time to get to know one another on a deeper level as human beings. We have to know how we receive feedback from one another. Um, we need to understand how each individual person gives feedback because all of these different scores, all of our different human personalities um, can be taken in a wrong way, which we've kind of, this is what brought us to Feedback April. Um, but we really have to get to know each other on that deeper level and earn trust amongst one another in order to work as one cohesive team. Um, we're gonna have the chefs that are in the kitchen. We're gonna have the waiters and waitresses that might not be in those, comfortable in those leadership roles. Um, so it's really taking the time to get to know the eights, the 19s, the 12s, the twos, the negative twos, in order to just be able to play off of one another and learn from strengths and weaknesses and use those to um, make something extraordinary. Great, and that's a perfect lead into where I'm going. So um, Alex, Alex, I don't wanna say your name wrong. Um, last name's Leon. I'm just gonna say Leon, because I don't wanna say your first name wrong. But this person said that they were born and raised in Mexico, um, where in Mexico, their advantage score would be much higher. But because they're here, their advantage score is one. Yes, Brandy, that's a wow, right? Because, oh, so I know sign language too, so I read lips. So because, where you live, and remember I talked about your external environment, <laughs> feeds into your advantages, right? And so here, they don't have the same advantages they would have if they were in their own, in their own home. Oh, okay. I see. Hold on, let me... I don't know if I have that. I don't know if I have that power. Hello? Yes, there you are. Oh, finally. Uh, this is another example of a disadvantage. <laughs> uh, yes. Having access to a microphone. Anyway, um, yeah, I was born and raised. I graduated uh, from my undergrad, uh, undergraduate um, degree in Mexico. Um, I was born in a family of educators. My mom had a master's degree. Um, I, went, I went to a private school. Um, I can also mention that my skin color is lighter. Um, so there's a lot of advantages that I know I would have if I moved back to Mexico. However, for family reasons, I am still here. And um, I feel myself navigating um, constantly, and even being unaware of it, um, with my Mexican label everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. When I was growing up, I was never um, asked to be identified as Mexican. Um, here, I am always Mexican. <laughs> um, so, I, I also have a PhD that I got at OSU. I've been, um, I, I don't want to brag about it. I don't want to um, say it everywhere because I don't want to come up as arrogant, <laughs> but I'm also a doctor. Um, 
that's uh, I'm 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 first Mexican. Um, I have mixed children, uh, so I've had to navigate that as well. My children, um, I'm hoping I can give them an advantage um, better than what they would have. I'm trying to give them better education. I'm trying to find always constantly um, uh, social circles. Uh, that um, would be, um, how to say, favorable to their mm -hmm. future. Um, so I have all that. I don't know what else. I, I can well, go on and on. Well, thank you for sharing, um, Dr. Leon. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge it, right? Uh, you, you earned that. Yeah. And, 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 and if yeah. we even just think about that, that. If we were um, not a part of the marginalized community, right, in this society, um, and Eric talked a little bit about this, right, right, this ethnocentrism that we have in this society, right, uh, Dr. Leon would not feel bad to say, I'm Dr. Leon, right, I've had to get used to it, I'm Dr. Benton, that's, that's huge, um, that is huge. Only 2% of the population has earned a doctorate. Babe, you stressed me out with your... So to be able to, to feel like I shouldn't say that, right, in the spaces that I'm in, then what does that say about the spaces that we're in? Like, I, I don't know. So th that's very powerful to me. So I'm going to talk and teach a little bit, just a little bit, just, just a little bit. Bear with me, okay? So the question is, is that then what do we do with this advantage, the, these advantage scores, and how do we increase them? How do we um, acknowledge them? How do we bring them up? The first thing that I would suggest is that we have to focus on our cultural intelligence, right? And it's the ability to function effectively in culturally diverse settings, right? How do you do that? Well, the first way is work on your magnet, your your meta uh, cognitive goals, right, or skills, I should say. So, your cultural awareness. Do you have the cultural awareness that you're supposed to have? Um, are you putting yourself in situations and learning um, about other cultures? Uh, then you have the knowledge of a particular culture. Um, based on what's happening in our society, there are particular cultures that we need to learn about more than others. There are some cultures that we've learned about our entire lives. There are some cultures that we haven't learned a lot about. There are some cultures that we've had misinformation about, right? And so how do we build that cognitive um, intelligence about a particular culture? And um, then you have to have a desire to learn and interact in other cultures. And I think this really motivational, this motivational intelligence is, is kind of like uh, where we fall short. A lot of people don't have the motivation. We do not have the motivation to learn. And we also, not only don't we have, we, we don't have the motivational to, to learn, but we also um, think that uh, if we work with a certain group of people, then we know them. <laughs> and we don't, right? Um, we, we don't have a clue. And so you have to interact and build relationships. Um, with people and and really like make an effort then you have behavior so now you have the motivation to learn well what's the ability to communicate can you communicate in cross-cultural settings and through that build through cross-cultural experiences and classes um can you really make those actions come alive can you bring them alive so really thinking about what your cultural intelligence is and some of our cultural intelligences are low. And it's because we don't interact or do anything outside of the people that we know. And that's not necessarily bad, right? You're not bad because you don't do that. It's that our society hasn't conditioned us to do that. We are more comfortable around people that we have been around our entire life. That's just kind of the way it is, right? And it isn't always, that doesn't always mean that you are um, 
bias or a racist or all those things that get attributed to the fact that you may not have a diverse circle, right? Or you may have different views of people. Does, does that make sense? One of the, this is a good example of this, of cultural intelligence is the school district that I went to, um, they were made up of neighborhoods and every neighborhood um, had a very different socioeconomic and cultural status, right? So one was um, lower black income uh, neighborhood. One was middle-class black, one was middle-class white, one was middle-class, um, one was upper middle class white, one was upper middle class uh, black. Uh, and then there was like two neighborhoods that were mixed. And my school was pretty much black and white. So we didn't have a lot of cultures unless they were foreign exchange students at this school. Um, and from kindergarten to sixth grade, you went to school in the neighborhood that you lived. So if you lived in a lower class economic black neighborhood, you went to that school had the same resources as the other schools, but the population was different. And then in middle school, they put us all together and they said, now you're gonna go to school as a one unit and you need to get along. You know what I found very interesting? If you were to walk into our school at lunchtime, you would see um, the cafeteria very segregated. Now, if you saw the cafeteria very segregated from an outsider looking in, you would think that we would have a race problem. Because we didn't sit with each other. Black sat on one side, white sat on another side. You know what it was? It wasn't that we had a race problem at our school. People sat with the friends. They sat with the people they went to elementary school with and they've known their entire life. See that? Culture intelligence needs to raise up because you could have easily attributed that to there's a big race problem going on. No, it wasn't. People sat with people they liked and they knew and that they've known their whole life. And that even goes for me. My best friend is, is white and we we're best friends uh, because we played volleyball together and we played sports together and we just love each other, right? And I don't think we sat together in the lunchroom one time. <laughs> Not one. She veered to her friends from elementary school. I veered to my friends from elementary school. It took a very long time for us to, now we, we hung out outside of school. We hung out in classes. But at lunch, we went to hang out with people we were eating lunch with our whole lives. Does that make sense? So sometimes things aren't as deep as, as we try to um, attribute things to. Sorry, I'm trying to navigate the, um, the chat too. So then we wanna think about, well, how do you then foster equity, right? In your business. So business case for equity. Um, equity is important because it's cost savings. You get market share if you have better decision making, and ultimately you have higher performance. Your bottom line benefits from equity, um, and so you have to adopt a learning and a, an effectiveness perspective, which recognizes cultural differences as valuable assets. And what this really goes to is when you're thinking about fostering equity, you're thinking about beliefs in that perspective. My entire dissertation was on what teachers believe makes Black kids learn. I didn't want to look at what teachers do. I didn't want to look at academics, state tests. I didn't want to look at all of those academic markers that we look with. I wanted to look at what are your beliefs because your beliefs drives your action. So when you believe that equity is important, when you believe that equity is a valuable asset, your actions then match that belief. Does that make sense? So we have to start with that premise, that belief, right? Can we begin to believe that everyone matters? and that equity is important. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. 
I know we're talking about equity and I know we're talking about, you know, race, but I think everybody, I'm for real, everyone, everyone. I think that the people who went to um, DC and, and stormed the Capitol, I think their voice was just as important as the people who were protesting um, against police brutality. The problem is, is just like the people who was protesting um, police brutality and some of them decided to do things that hurt humanity, right? And the same thing with the people of the Capitol and they decided to do things that hurt humanity. The problem is their actions that hurt humanity, not in the voice and what they were trying to share. They're just as valuable. Their voices are all important. It's when we begin to do things that hurt each other that makes it wrong. Does that make sense? Because we have to bring out the we have to bring out the good, the better good in each other. We have to bring out the highest selves of each other. And when we don't do that, it causes a lot of problems. So in both situations, both groups in instances could have done things differently to say what they needed to say that would have been better for humanity. But there's some obstacles to equity. And this is the this is where we get to the point where we don't like to talk about. This is the this is the truth of it. The dilemma with belonging, the obstacles to equity. Um, this is why people don't belong, feel like they belong, and this is why we have a hard time with equity. Um, prejudice, right? Negative attitudes toward others or different um, backgrounds, and we all prejudge. We all prejudge, and we just need to go ahead and just acknowledge that. <laughs> we do. We prejudge. I taught, uh, uh, and we stereotype too, classifying groups according to their similarities. I taught middle school. And I promise you, um, one, uh, five years of middle school, five years of middle school girls made me never, ever, 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 ever want to have a little girl. I am prejudiced. I stereotype. And it's a hot mess to the point where when I was pregnant with my son, I had to get three ultrasounds to make sure it was a boy. Because if it was going to be a little girl, I was going to have other plans. It was like, um, I don't know about this. Let's look at adoption. I was sincere because the middle school girls gave me a run for my money. My niece gave me a run for my money. And as an educator and as a teacher, once I got out of middle school and I got into high school, I started finding that I was just a little bit more meaner to the girls. A girl would raise their hand and ask to go to the bathroom. I'd be like, no. <laughs> A boy would ask and I would go, oh, sure, go ahead. I was so much kinder to the boys and I couldn't figure out what was it that made me so mean to the girls. Like I didn't give them a chance. I was just like, mm -mm, no, you know, you did that. Nope, nope, stop talking. Mm -mm, you're talking too much, just stop. And they would give me, they would give me that, that, that girl, that girl attitude. And I would be like, oh, and so because I started finding a pattern in that, I had to reflect and do some self-reflection to find out what's really the problem. Where's this coming from? And when I began to reflect, I realized it was the middle school girls. And it changed my, I, stare, I have stereotyped all girls to fit into this bucket when that's not necessarily true, right? Um, but that was my experience. It was the self-reflection that helped me get out of stereotyping girls. Does that make sense? But I couldn't get to the self-reflection until I was honest. So, you know, then we have so many other things, right? But I want to talk about social conditioning. I'm going to jump down. And so social conditioning is the influence of society on our thoughts, words, and our actions. And the reality of it is, is that we are socially conditioned. 
we are socially conditioned with our beliefs. And so the question is, are you brave enough, right? Are you brave enough? If we look at uh, the poet Amanda's words, are you brave enough to look at your beliefs, your thoughts and, 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 and your actions and challenge what you've been taught about yourself, about society, about the world, and about any other thing that you strongly believe. Can you challenge your own beliefs? And if you can, if you can honor that and accept that, you can possibly do things to overcome equity barriers. So as individuals, you can apply the cultural um, intelligence. You can promote dignity and integrity and inclusion in your workplaces. You can engage in mindful communication, not just what how the weather is, actual real conversation, right? Create new categories, welcome new information, open to different points of view, and then question your social conditioning by being open to self. Um, they are making us leave a little earlier than I want. It's not even time yet. Um, about your self society and beliefs. Organization, you can get buy in of the top leadership. If your leader doesn't buy into equity, it's already failed. So employ data driven strategies for your leaders. Give them the data, show them the bottom line, show them how equity really helps your organization. Promote diversity in education, develop systems that support diversity goals, and then follow up and measure progress because the reality of it is, is what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it, people won't do it. What gets measured gets done. Blend agency with communion, build social capital through good relationships. And I kind of, because I'm out of time, I feel like we were supposed to have a little bit more time in our breakout sessions. Is there yeah, any way I think back to our breakout sessions? We were supposed to have more time. I don't know what happened. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. We didn't even. I didn't even get to talk about some about <laughs> ally behaviors. Like what? Yeah, up? we we still have a good twenty minutes. So is there is there a way but for us to get back to our? I think Farley's aware, and I think she said she was going to be putting us back in. She's probably uh, okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Well, yeah. hey, I everybody. know. I get to see everybody again. <laughs> yeah, I caught an option when it was counting down the first time. The second time, it didn't give us an option, but it was sitting on zero. I thought it would stay there. What happened? So you, the breakout room ended early, but I have the option to open the rooms back up. How Would much you do that? Do yes. How much more time do we have? Uh, oh. Until 11 o'clock. That's what I thought. Um, someone just opened all the rooms. So. <laughs> it I Okay, we're back. <laughs> Technology, you gotta love it. So I have more time, I can slow down. But they only gave us 10 minutes. It's gonna, it's gonna cut out again because they didn't put the time right. Um, so really here is really where I want to get to, right? Uh, you, you built this agency of there is space to be both tough and decisive as well as warm and caring. We, we need to be able to have a balance of both. But then you build social capital through good relationships. Truthfully, to me, the thing that really, um, the key to, to equity, what my research even suggests is relationships and collaboration. Um, when you build relationships with people, it changes your entire view of everything because now it becomes personal. It's not just what's happening over there to this 
group of people or those people. It's what's happening to my friend. <laughs> it's you're living and being a part of other people's lived experiences. And the more and more you begin to do that, the more and more you can narrow the gap when it comes to equity. The equitable gap, um, uh, they're leaving, they're making us leave again. This is gonna, this is frustrating. We're gonna leave the breakout room again and we're gonna come back and hopefully they will set it to 20 minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna be quiet. But not everybody could rejoin their room. So I'm going to open back up their rooms again so they can rejoin their, their facilitators. So please be patient. You should have a button now that says join here, rejoin. You should have something that indicates. There's a lot that I'm like, this is so good. Stop moving me out. I'm muted. There we go. Social capital is, is really what helps um, us close the equity, um, narrow the gap, right? So we can have more equitable gaps, right? Um, when you build good relationships, I'm going to repeat this because I don't know who heard it. So when you have good relationships, what that really does is it brings things and it makes it more personal for you. And so instead of us becoming this kind of I society, we become a we society. We become a one society because I'm no longer thinking about what's happening over there because it's right here in my face. It's happening to someone that I actually love, that I care about, that's in my everyday lived experience. And so I get to experience their experiences with them when I have good relationships with them, if that makes any sense. So um, another thing is you got to challenge on um, discrimination and dysfunctional communication patterns. And really communication patterns in our society is, is really based on our social conditioning. And sometimes we don't know when we're not communicating effectively or when we're communicating in a way that hurts individuals. So like when I was working with the Asian um, organization, um, what I realized is uh, my culture is I'm, I'm a very loud and I, and I am animated and I, I, it's kind of how we grew up. And then for them, that was kind of off-putting, right? And so I had to look at the communication patterns that was really maybe stopping us from being able to move forward. And I had to honor their space in our space, correct? So there were times where I had to kind of pull back, right? To open up the room for them to be able to feel like they could speak up. And I had to kind of, Although being authentic, being authentic doesn't necessarily mean you can't embrace someone else's um, needs and cultural uh, patterns. Does, does that make sense? 
And so you have to kind of learn how to give and take there. Um, and then, you know, I have big issues with bystanders. So I feel like, you know, you have to confront the exclusion, dismissal of, of, of contributions, uh, retaliations, um, patronizing responses. You got to confront that. You can't allow that to continue to happen in, in workspaces, in places that you gather. When you see something, say something. That's how we stop racism. That's how we stop inequitable practices. When you see something, you say something. And it really doesn't matter on, on what level, right? Um, gosh, I wish I had more time because I had another story that I, that I think would hit home with that. Um, but when you see something, say something. I think I'm gonna tell the story and leave it here. The idea of equity is really about creating what we call safer spaces. A lot of times people talk about safe space, but the reality of it is, is there is no such thing as safe space because we can't guarantee everything. Spaces aren't safe. What we can do is focus on helping spaces be safer, right? So safer spacers um, that all people can be in and participate in. And so a good example is in my classroom, for instance, there was a biracial boy that um, gave a lot of teachers problems. And on this particular day, he came um, to my class. He had my class um, first period, and he was really mad. He was really upset. And he was upset because they gave him two Englishes back to back. They gave him English nine, and they gave him English 10. Now, this particular student's parents were incarcerated. He could not read. Um, he did not pass English um, in the ninth grade. Um, but for whatever reason, they decided to schedule him two Englishes back to back, first thing in the morning. So he came to class really upset and he was upset and going off. And I just was like, you know, just, you know, why don't you just go talk to them and see if they can change your schedule? Um, I had him in class. So he had my class. He comes back and he goes, they didn't, they wouldn't talk to me. And while we were in class, I started to get him to be engaged. And I was like, okay, well, I'll talk to them after class, what have you. Um, then all of a sudden, they came in to my class, the principal stormed in and just was like, you know, uh, we need this student to come out because he came down the hall and he was being um, loud and um, we, we just need to get him. And I was like, well, I'm teaching class. You need to get him later because I'm, I'm teaching class. Make a long story short, um, he gets so upset, he throws his Chromebook down and I just looked at him and I was like, okay. And I picked up his Chromebook. I was like, you upset, but we still got to learn. <laughs> we got to figure this out. And then he pushes me, he, he wants to leave the class. So then I'm like, ah, oh, you leave the class. I got to call and tell them. They bring them, they send them back to class. When they send him back to class, he pushes me out the door, like out the doorway to get into class because he was upset. Make a long story short, um, they wanted me to write him up. They brought down the police officer. They were just adamant. Oh, you need to write him up. You need to write him up. You need to write him up. And I was like, no, I don't. And they were like, but, but he pushed you. And no, I don't care. He was just trying to get in class. I'm not writing him up. I said, I don't believe in the school, the prison, the school pipeline. So I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting that on this record. And they just kind of looked at me. And this goes with blending agency. And this kind of goes with challenging discrimination. And this also goes with good relationships. I knew him. And I knew that he couldn't read. And I knew what his issue was. And he came to try to talk to them about their issue. And they dismissed him. I would be upset too. And what I told them is the problem isn't him. The problem is you all not embracing equitable practices, stereotyping him, putting him into this box, and then not giving him what he needs. So therefore, 
I don't see the problem with him. I see the problem with you. So if you want to write him up, you need to write him up. I'm not writing him up. If anything, I want to write you up. You can only imagine what my principal was looking at me saying, like, oh my gosh, we need to get rid of love. <laughs> um, because, and I was so sincere. So that student saw me stand up for what was right. And it changed the entire trajectory of his life. He ended up graduating. He ended up learning how to read. He ended up graduating with a B average. He ended up going to college. He, he went to community college. He ended up um, getting a certification to work in mechanics. And he is flourishing because I stood up. Because I confronted the exclusion that was happening in that moment. And that was worth it. So if you want to narrow the gap, if you want to really create safer spaces, it really begins with you using your voice for good, with you using your privilege, right? Your, your advantage for good, because I had an advantage. I had the number one test scores and I was their number one English teacher. That gave me an advantage. I knew they couldn't do anything to me. So why not? use my advantage to help someone else. So that's how, that's how we really narrow that gap. Does that make sense? All right, I got some chats. All right, I'm happy I was able to tell my story. <laughs> I wanted to really get that story in because I think that was a good example of, of really how to do it, right? And, and I think when you know yourself, you can do it. A lot of us had high advantage scores. Let's use it. Let's use it to make a difference. The, the next slide was really, I was going to skip it, but it was how to kind of create this idea of this cultural synergy, right? And a synergistic a problem solving process and how do you kind of go through it when you're in your workspaces, right? The idea is for us to kind of become one. So when you have inequitable practices happening, the first thing you can do is identify the dilemma or conflict and then determine why members of other cultures think and act as they do. Um, identify your similarities and your differences. So number two, step two is important. The why is important. There's a reason why people act the way that they do. And it's not always about culture. Sometimes it's really just about their lived experiences, right? We just attribute everything to culture and race in this country, but it's really bigger than culture and race. And then step, step three is ask what individuals can contribute to people of other cultures. And then step four is the implementation of a solution sensitive to the cultural differences. So this kind of gives you kind of a guide on how to create like a synergetic, cultural synergetic uh, space or safer space in, in your works, in your workspaces and in your fields. And with that, I'm finished. Belonging still begins with you. Safer spaces are created when we create space for all humanity. Now I feel finished. <laughs> That was amazing, Dr. Benton. Um, I did click the keep the all breakout rooms open. So we're okay. open without any remaining time right now until Vorley broadcasts for us. Um, so if we wanna continue the conversation, if there's anybody who has questions or wants to share, um, second anything that they captured from this session, um, please feel free to jump in. If you're not comfortable coming off of mute, um, please feel free to, free to utilize the chat. I can kind of navigate the chat and give you the questions that might pop up there. So Deb said trauma-informed care is, is so important. Trauma-informed care is, is very important. I, I work with the attorney general here um, in Ohio and we're, we're working on some um, connecting um, services for trauma-informed care, right? And trauma-informed care kind of speaks to um, individuals lived experiences as well. And 
it's not just um, marginalized uh, populations that it, it experience trauma. We all have experienced trauma in some form, in some way, um, whether it's something that we've seen on TV um, that has that was live and it didn't happen to us, but it still caused a trauma reaction or something that we, we um, yes, thank you, or something that we, um, have experienced ourselves. So trauma-informed care and, and understanding the practices of trauma-informed care, once again, helps lead to more equitable practices in your workspace. Um, understanding trauma responses, um, because when you understand a trauma response, it takes it out of the wheelhouse, once again, of culture and race. And it actually has you look at the individual as a whole person um, and you begin to see them and all of the services that they may need to be the best, their best selves. So thank you, Deb, for, for that. Yes. And on your closing slide, um, safe spaces also don't necessarily have to be a physical space. I know that um, I work in a building, it's 855,000 square feet, there's 7,000 people. But I found that I have connections with so many people that come to me when there's something, especially throughout 2020, if there's something that's going on in the world that's affecting them, if there's something that's going on in their lives that's affecting them, um, you kind of build these relationships like we've been talking about and we can see when something's going on with someone and stop to have that conversation. Um, so what's important to remember, especially coming out of 2020, navigating into 2021, um, we ourselves are safe spaces for individuals also. Um, so it doesn't have to be four walls. It doesn't have to be a standing building. Um, and that's what's important in these times. Yeah, Sarah, that, that goes right to the point of communication, right? Your safer spaces can be how you communicate. And, and how you show up for individuals, right? And making sure that you yourself um, are safer. Exactly. That's okay, Jamie, I'm sorry you lost your voice. <laughs> Anyone else? Ms. Parks, is that a classroom I see? Dr. Benton, I would just like to say thank you so much for sharing. I think, you know, our, our pause and our comments and our question is um, a testimony to uh, what you have shared with all of us this morning and a lot to think about. And uh, we all have uh, so much growing to do in all of these areas um, as we continue to grow in creating a community of belonging uh, for our environments here. So I just can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your experiences and uh, sharing uh, a way forward for all of us. Um, Jamie put in the, thank you so much, Deb. Jamie, Jamie put in the chat, wanted to touch on secondary trauma and the impact of the Derek Chauvin trial happening right now when the racial demographics in our workspaces tend to be uh, predominantly white. You know, listen, in our country, the, we, it's predominantly white and we know it's because of systematic racism and, and, and how this country was kind of created, founded and all of those things. Secondary trauma is, is, is huge um, because as we watch this, um, we are reliving uh, a, a, a murder of someone. And there's no way to get around that, right? It doesn't matter how that happened, who was involved. Watching a murder is trauma, is, is trauma in itself. Uh, just take out every other element. Watching someone lose their life is traumatic, right? And so when we're in our spaces and we are together, this is where empathy and compassion must show up. Right, because it's the death itself. I may not have experienced racial injustice, but I might have experienced death. 
it's not all that's why I, I keep going back to we like to frame things in this race when really we need to frame things in humanity to me it's not about uh to me it's about human rights and when we can get over race <laughs> and focus on humanity we can then focus on things like secondary trauma uh, being white in this country definitely is an advantage, but it doesn't make all white people bad. It just is what it is. You're still human first. You're still human first. And that trial, I, and I would say, and I didn't talk a lot about this, but I would say in order to really have equity, in order to really practice humaneness, you have to first practice self-care. You have to first practice taking good care of yourself and knowing what your triggers are and knowing what's traumatic for you and being able to share that authentically with people you feel safe with, letting people in and being a little bit more transparent. We're not transparent, so people don't really get to know us. But, you know, I had one friend say, I can't be watching all that law and order and all that other stuff because I'm telling you, I can't, I love medical shows. I can't watch Grey's Anatomy because when I see Grey's Anatomy, the first thing I see is my brother being in the hospital with tubes inside of him dying. I never thought about that until he said that. So he's black like me and I love Grey's Anatomy. So I so when he's over Thursdays, Grey's Anatomy isn't on my TV because now I'm more mindful. And this is about practicing the art of mindfulness, right? So I just don't watch it. So I don't have the Derek Chauvin case on because I have a little eight-year-old boy here and we're in COVID. And sometimes he's at school and sometimes he's at home. So that means the case isn't on because I don't want to introduce that trauma to him. Not yet, right? Linda, um, we're about to go, but I just noticed that you were in the classroom are you are you a teacher? Quick, I am a career specialist for the job program at Newark High School in Lincoln ah, County, Ohio. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for your work and your service in this trying times. Thank you. Thank you as well. So I think that's it. I think we're about to be gone. Yeah. And I will see you guys in the main group. Thank you. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, we are going to flip a little bit around that might be in the program that you're looking at, but we're gonna go into our polls and discussions. Um, during these polls and discussions, each of us might've participated in a different group. We might've been with Dr. Benton, with Eric Jory, with Sima Lieberman. Um, so when these polls come up, if you were a part of this group, if you could hop off of mute, um, to participate and to share. Dr. Benton is going to give us a reflection of the first group, the power of advantage engaging with diverse population in the workplace. Sarah, are my poll questions up? There they we go. are up right now. All right, thank you. Uh, and so in our group, everyone, we talked about the power of advantage and we talked about how to use our advantages um, in our, our workplaces and how to uh, reduce equity. So the first question is, uh, what does your advantage score reveal about your uh, lived experience? Um, so if your advantage score was a zero to 13, 14 to 18, a 19 to 22, there are some that were negative as well. I'm go ahead and answer that question so you can we can see where it says. And so we what we found is majority people advantage scores were on the lower end. And really what that means is that their lived experiences um, has not necessarily had.